Hi, my name is Anna Minnehart, and I am your host for today's talk. I'm here with our speaker, Dr. Greg Zaharchuk, neuroradiologist and professor at Stanford University. Happy to be here, Anna. Thank you for being here. We'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, How Deep Learning and AI Are Making Clinical Neuroimaging Faster, Safer, and Smarter. Our discussion will be around 20 minutes long, and then we'll open it up for about 10 minutes of live Q&A. Everybody will be muted during the discussion, so be sure to either write down your questions or submit them as we go along so that we can address them during the Q&A. So Dr. Zaharchuk, before we get started, what are you hoping that everyone can take away from today's discussion? Sure, so a couple of points. I want to talk about the value of deep learning for radiology, which I think is going to be really transformative. I want to talk about how we're using AI to improve image quality. I want to also talk about how we use it to try to make imaging safer. And then lastly, I want to talk about how we can use it for personalized medicine by predicting the future. Okay, so can you speak to how AI is affecting the various aspects of the value chain of radiology? Sure, so when we think of radiology, uh, radiology really starts at the scanner. And you know, the first thing that happens is the patient has their scan, the image is acquired, and then you may have some enhancement or visualization. Uh, from then on, you get sort of more into the area of diagnosis and prognosis. And this is traditionally what radiologists have been doing. And then finally, everything is put together as part of the patient's treatment plan. And a lot of the excitement in deep learning has been around the, the end of this, the right side of this slide, so to speak, where we can use deep learning to actually do the diagnosis better, perhaps, than a radiologist. What I want to talk about today is a little bit more of, you know, what is the advantage of deep learning to the left-hand side of this slide, where we're actually acquiring images and we're enhancing them and visualizing them. Because I think that this has a much bigger impact on patients. It is a much more immediate win. It has great financial value for hospitals, uh, but also for patients. It can make these scans safer, it can make them faster, and they're really fundamental for all of the stuff that goes on downstream. So I think that focusing on this is a really exciting area to explore. So you mentioned in the value chain that AI companies are focused on diagnoses. Can you give us some examples about this? Sure. So the real progress that's made over the last couple of years has been to basically use advances from computer vision to uh, take many, many images and to train a neural network to predict a certain diagnosis. And you can use a structure that's shown here. This is a deep convolutional neural network. And you can see on the left, we start with many images where we train the network, and then we try to predict a specific diagnosis, such in this case, we're trying to predict whether the image on the screen is a normal image, or is it a patient with a tumor, or a stroke, or a hemorrhage. And if we know the truth, if we know the ground truth of the images, we can actually train the network to then predict well on images that it's never seen. So this is the bottom part of this graph, where we deploy the network, and hopefully what happens is, as in this example, where you have a patient shown with a hemorrhage, this network has been trained, and at the output it's predicting one of four possible classes, and you hope that it predicts hemorrhage as being the most common class. So this is the approach that people have shown works very well for things like chest x-rays. There's a lot of excitement in the area of non-contrast head CT and predicting hemorrhage. But this is a complicated problem. This is not easy to do. So you can imagine with four different diagnoses, maybe you could do it, but you can imagine that in real life, you know, this would be great if you had one of those four diagnoses, but of course, you don't really know what someone has when they come in. And there are probably a couple thousand diagnoses that radiologists typically diagnose. So this makes this method very challenging. I think long-term, this is tremendously exciting, especially in places where there are no radiologists. I wanna to talk today a little bit more uh, about the idea of uh, predicting images. Okay, so let's talk about that other part of the value mm -hmm. chain, the image processing and acquisition. Mm -hmm. Instead of predicting diagnoses, how do you use AI to improve imaging? Right, so that's a great question. So, as in the previous slide, instead of trying to predict one of four classes of an image, uh, as the output of the network, my goal is to uh, predict an actual image 
and then compare that to the image that I would like to have. So you can imagine if I start with a low quality image and I use a network such as shown in this slide, if I can then produce an image using a structure such as this called a decoder encoder structure, some people call it a UNet because it's shaped a little bit like a U. Uh, if I can actually use this to upsample the layers and to predict at the end, predict an image, if I know the true image, I can then use that to train the network just as I did in the previous example. Stanford has done a lot of work in this area, correct? Mm -hmm. So can you share some of your latest research? Sure. So let me start by talking a little bit about MRI. So MRI usually takes a long time. That's one of the reasons that it's so expensive. So what we've been working at is, you know, how do we speed up MRI? Nobody likes to be in the machine for 45 minutes. Not at all. So our idea is that if we could take a lower quality image, such as shown here, this is an example of perfusion imaging, and if we also can acquire a high quality image, perhaps by imaging much longer, we can then take that low quality fast image and use it to train a network to predict the high quality image. And so as in this example you can see on the right, uh, by using the low SNR fast image along with uh, other images that we routinely acquire, we can produce a synthetic image which is very similar to the long duration high signal to noise image as shown here. And we've shown that with this method we can speed things up by about four times. Now another thing that most radiologists like are high resolution images so that they can see very small structures. But unfortunately it takes a long time to acquire these kind of images. So one approach called super resolution is to acquire low resolution images which are faster and then uh, try to predict what the high resolution image looks like as shown in this slide. There's a lot of concern around both radiation exposure and the potential effects of MR contrast agents such as gadolinium used in scanning. You also mentioned faster imaging in the title of this presentation. Can you share how with PET, for example, you can achieve faster scan times or lower dose imaging and the impact that this could potentially have on hospital throughput? Sure. So uh, PET imaging is a, a molecular imaging methodology that is very useful for many different diagnoses. And the way it works is by injecting a radiopharmaceutical into the body and then putting the patient inside a very large camera called a PET machine to take a picture of the image. So in this case, uh, you can imagine that the reason you have to stay in there longer is so that you get enough events in the camera so that the quality of the image is of, of good quality. So you can imagine that just like the previous example, when we did a fast MRI scan of low quality, we could do a faster PET scan. So in this example, this is a whole body FDG scan. And as you could see here on the left, a 24 minute scan is of diagnostic quality. But if you only leave the person in the scanner for six minutes, the quality is suboptimal. But if I know what the longer duration images look like, I can train a network essentially to predict that image without having to have the patient in the scanner. This of course would be greatly beneficial to patients who don't like to stay still in these scanners for long periods of time. It's great for hospitals, which may be able to scan more people uh, during a single day. But you can also think about using this technology in a different way. So again, uh, when we talk about events that are being captured by the camera, we can think of, well, maybe we can inject a lower dose of the radio tracer and then do a normal length scan and we'd get an image kind of similar to the image in the center here, but instead of having given the patient a full radiation dose, we're giving them a much smaller radiation dose. So again, this might be very beneficial for patients that maybe need to get a lot of these scans, patients who are younger, pediatric patients, and so forth. Uh, so there are a bunch of different ways you can look at uh, image quality improvement from a safety perspective for PET. Now, one other area where uh, safety is going to be important is going to be in amyloid PET imaging. So amyloid is a tracer that identifies uh, where plaques are building up in the brain, which are thought to be a precursor to Alzheimer's disease. And there's a lot of interest in whether we can image these early before the disease has an onset. And because of that, we're going to be dealing with younger patients and we may be dealing with screening populations. So one thing we've explored is, you know, how low can you go in terms of dose for these patients? And some of the work in our group has shown that if you reduce the dose by a hundredfold, so you're talking about 1% dose images, and then you include the MRI images 
in the model as well. You can actually predict the amyloid PET images uh, with the same diagnostic quality as a full dose scan. And just to put it into perspective, you know, one one hundredth of the dose, that's similar to the kind of radiation we would get just doing a cross country airline flight. Uh, so it really can revolutionize uh, PET imaging and make it a much more widespread and much more useful technique. So one other way you can think about safety is not necessarily radiation, but you can think of it as other uh, aspects of radiology, such as contrast dose. So MRI contrast dose has always been thought to be very safe, but about 10 years ago we realized that patients with kidney disease uh, are prone to get a, a severe disease from deposition of this agent in their bodies called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. So now we avoid giving these patients this kind of contrast, but only a couple years ago we learned that this compound actually deposits in the brain even in people with normal kidney function. And this has people worried. Nobody has seen any ill effects of it yet, but you know we're just really starting to understand that. So we decided we'd do a study where, just like before, uh, if we could do a suboptimal quality image, say with only 10% of the contrast dose, you know, maybe we could then predict the full dose from the 10% dose. And we did some of that work uh, last year at Stanford and found that uh, it actually worked pretty well. And we're very excited to really start rolling this out uh, soon in a clinical way. So you can also apply these methods to reduce MR contrast dose. Mm -hmm. Okay. You are a neuroradiologist, so let's talk about something that's near and dear to your heart. Mm -hmm. Can you compare the traditional methods versus the benefits of using deep learning algorithms for predicting stroke outcomes? Sure. Yeah, so this gets to kind of the idea of predicting the future. So in stroke, often when somebody comes in, the, the important questions are really, you know, how much of the brain is dead, how much of it is still savable. We'd like to be able to predict what they're going to look like when the stroke is complete. And historically, the way we've done that is with diffusion imaging and perfusion imaging, where the abnormality on diffusion, shown here on the left, shows you the area of tissue that's already dead. Whereas the perfusion image, shown here in the color, uh, is the area that is at risk of dying in the absence of a procedure. Now, this has worked pretty well, but it's a rules-based system, and it doesn't really capture the full complexity of the situation. And one of the things that we've learned recently is that it, using a deep learning method where we actually take the input data, as being the data when the patient shows up at the hospital, the images in the acute setting, you know, can we then predict what the outcome will be, say, five days later, to give people an idea of potential prognosis. And uh, initial studies show that deep learning models you know, outperform these rule-based models quite well. I think the really exciting part here is the idea of training networks for different interventions. Because in stroke, we have the option to do nothing, or we have the option to potentially uh, give a treatment for stroke. But this treatment comes with some sort of risk, so we don't want to do it in everyone. So the question is, could you train a network in patients who uh, received treatment and the treatment was successful, and in the same group of patients or similar patients in which the treatment either wasn't given or wasn't successful? And then you can imagine that uh, when you have a new patient that shows up, if you've trained these two different models, perhaps what you can do is take the initial images, run them through the treatment model and the non-treatment model, and to see, is there a benefit to treatment? Not so much by a simple binary decision, but more of predicting the image, predicting the image that's gonna occur in the future, uh, as in this example on the right. So these are two patients, very similar, similar ages, similar severity of stroke, similar time from onset. And you can see in the top example, the model that was trained with the treatment, which in this case was TPA, which is a clot-busting drug, uh, would predict a smaller final stroke lesion compared to the model that actually was trained on people who were treated. So this is a patient who we think is going to benefit from treatment. Whereas the patient on the bottom looks very similar, uh, except when we run it through these two models, we see a very different picture. We see that the size of the stroke looks about the same whether you treat or not. So this patient may not be an optimal patient for treatment. So I think this is very exciting because what we're really doing then is personalizing therapy. We're kind of predicting what 
uh, whether treatment will be successful, uh, if it is successful, what will the patient look like at a time point in the future? And stroke is one example, but you can imagine this applied to many other different situations in which you'd like to know what people look like with different interventions and do that on a very personalized basis. So Dr. Zaharchuk, how would you summarize the key take-home messages from today's discussion? Sure. So I hope I've convinced you that uh, image transformation with AI is really going to transform the way we do radiology. It's going to fundamentally change our assumptions about how much imaging should cost, how fast it should be, and how much dose we need to use. And then finally, I think by predicting the future, we're going to enable a whole new era of radiology where we can really personalize treatment to specific indications and specific treatments. So it's a very exciting time. It's fascinating. So thank you, Dr. Zaharchuk, for sharing your experience with all of us. At this time, we're going to open the floor for questions. Please submit it using the directions uh, on the slide. If you haven't already, so probably cut off. All right, everyone. So we are here. And uh, if you see to the right of your screen, you will see uh, a drop down that shows questions. So go ahead and click that drop down. And that is where you can enter in any questions that you have. You can either share it privately or share it with the rest of the uh, attendees today. And so we do have a couple that have come in. So we're going to start uh, answering those questions. Let's see. The first question for Dr. Zaharchek is, why do we need images at all versus going from raw data to report? Thanks, Anna. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, I get that question a lot. Um, uh, you know, historically, radiology has always been about images, and uh, so we're very comfortable with uh, interpreting images. But you can imagine that if you have algorithms that uh, can take an image and interpret it, uh, you know, the question is why not go directly from the raw data that from the scanner itself uh, to something like a report or some sort of outcome. I think that uh, you know a lot of uh, software startups are very interested in that idea because radiologists tend to be uh, in scarce supply and and pretty expensive commodities. But it's very challenging because you don't always know what an image is going to be used for, uh, and if, if you do, you know maybe that's okay. Uh, for example, with amyloid PET imaging, you might. All you want to know is whether it's a positive scan or a negative scan. But in most imaging tasks, it's not that simple. Uh, and really, uh, interpreting the image requires a lot of background on you know, why the image was ordered, what prior studies might look like, uh, and things like that. So that's one major issue. Uh, the second is really potentially archiving, that we may need these images in the future to understand you know, why certain decisions are being made, or if there are a question that comes up later. Uh, in a patient's treatment, you can go back and have someone take a look at the images. So, you know, while I think there's promise in this idea of what, what we might call an end-to-end -end solution, um, I think that for right now, it's going to be really important to produce images for people to look at and for radiologists to use their expertise to try to interpret those images. Wonderful. Okay. And let's go on to number two now. Uh, number two is how can you be sure the transformed images are really of diagnostic quality? Okay, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, again, that speaks a little to the first answer. Um, you know, if you don't know why an image is being ordered, sometimes it's hard to figure out if the image that you create is better than the image you would have gotten if you didn't apply AI. <laughs> so, you know, we've tried to look at a lot of different metrics um, mainly by putting these images in front of radiologists. So you can do a lot of calculations. So you can calculate how similar an image looks like to a gold standard image. Um, and that can show you generally that you're getting closer to creating better images. Uh, but the trouble is that you can have an image that looks, you know, 99% uh, 
like you know the image that you would get perhaps with longer scans or with contrast but there might be one little spot on the image that's really the only important part maybe the part where a tumor enhances and if you don't get that right then there's no value uh, to doing the study you actually end up missing the lesion so these are very difficult questions i think and you know Long term, I think the key is going to be getting these images in front of radiologists as much as possible. We like to throw you the tough ones, huh? <laughs> okay, number three, could you end up creating fake lesions on images that aren't really there? Okay, um, this is also kind of a common question. <laughs> this idea that uh, these algorithms could potentially cause hallucinations, so uh, lesions that don't really exist that are being kind of brought up out of thin air. And there's certainly AI algorithms out there that, uh, in theory, uh, could do this. And, you know, without a ground truth image, uh, there's really, you know, very challenging to know whether that is happening. So the only ways you can really look at that is in cases where you actually have the ground truth. Uh, such as, you know, part of your testing set, for example, in, you know, an AI type application. But again, those sets can't be tremendously large. So eventually when this gets out into practice, um, you know, that will be a question. We will say that we really haven't seen um, a lot of hallucinations uh, in these images so far. But again, we've tested on, you know, thousands of images, but, you know, obviously there, there could be more out there. Um, the other thing I would just say about the idea of image hallucinations is that, you know, we already have hallucinations in images and, you know, we call them artifacts and radiologists are very good at identifying artifacts uh, and discounting them. Now, the danger with AI, I think, is that it can create artifacts that look so real that radiologists aren't used to identifying them. But I would say in general, uh, radiologists are pretty good at this. It's what they do for a living. Uh, so I would suspect that, you know, if there were uh, hallucinations, unless they were tremendously subtle, uh, we would we would find those. Uh, but, you know, certainly a good concern and good question. Great. Thank you, Dr. Zaharchuk. Uh, any more questions? I'm going to try to come in here and make sure we are not missing anything. Let's see. Looks like Rodney has a question. It says, looks like SNR reduction with AI. Any proof that RADs reading AI high SNR images perform better than non-AI enhanced low SNR images? Sure. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think what you're trying to say is that um, AI is... Um, improving the SNR of the images. But the question is, you know, would a radiologist come to the same conclusion uh, reading just the unenhanced low SNR images? And that's a good question. So, I mean, obviously those are the studies that you need to perform. <clears throat> now, the, the issue there um, is that, you know, often we acquire images either at higher resolution or more images than we really need necessarily to make a diagnosis. So the question often isn't, you know, do you make the diagnosis or not? But it may be, you know, how confident you are in the diagnosis, um, uh, questions like that. But, but that's a great question. I mean, obviously, you know, we would like to add value and show that, you know, we're actually creating an improvement that's necessary. All right. Thanks for the question, Rodney. And Roman wants to know, why do you need patients at all if you can predict them? Why stop at 10% dose and not go to 1% or 0.01%? Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by uh, not needing patients at all. I mean, there is some interesting work going on in the field of uh, having learned a distribution of images and then predicting uh, images, uh, additional images for the use of data augmentation and for training algorithms such as patients that never existed before. Um, there's certainly uh, that being used, and I think that's really being used mainly as a tool for um, trying to train algorithms, not so much for uh, anything else. 
Uh, your second question about, you know, why stopping at 10% dose and not going lower? You know, when we started looking at this uh, in my lab at Stanford, we, we chose 10% because 10% was typically the pre-dose of gadolinium that we give before we do a perfusion scan. This is recommended to reduce leakage. Uh, so we had this data in-house. Um, it's also fairly easy, I think, for the technologists to figure out what dose to give if we ask for 10%. But your question is very good. You know, would this work at 1%? Would this work at 0.1%? We've definitely been researching, you know, lower contrast, but mostly moving to, you know, 0% dose. Because the question is, you know, is the information about the enhancement actually present somewhere uh, in the non-contrast images, especially if you include advanced MRI sequences as part of that imaging, such as arterial spin labeling or resting state fMRI or, or uh, QSM. So we've been, uh, you know, starting to look at that. We have some results uh, so far looking at zero-dose contrast prediction, but this is, as you can imagine, much more challenging than denoising a 10% dose image. But great question. All right, and so it looks like we have a few minutes left, so if you have any other questions, please submit them now. It looks like we have one more, uh, and that question is, could you do zero dose contrast, or is that similar to oh, the that, previous one? I think, yeah, we kind of discussed that before. I think it's challenging. I think the good news about that is that there's a lot of potential training data, but we're definitely uh, exploring that. But you know, I think that will take a little bit longer to really feel confident. You know, maybe if you had nothing and no possibility to give uh, contrast, you, you might want to use it. All right. Okay, and will we get the video recording? Um, you know what? I, I think we can do that. We can absolutely share the video with everyone. I think it's going to, we're probably going to post it to our YouTube uh, page as well. Subtle Medical has, uh, if you want to Google Subtle, Subtle Medical in the YouTube bar, um, you'll be able to catch our webinars there, which leads us to the fact that um, you know, this is the first of many in the Subtle Webinar or Subtle Insights series. Um, we're hopefully going to do one of these webinars once a month, if not once every other month. And the goal of these webinars is really, you know, to talk about what you want to hear about. These are for you. Um, and so if there are any suggestions you have, things that you want to learn about, um, researchers you want to talk to, definitely don't hesitate to ping, uh, you know, ping either here or contact us on Subtle Medical's website um, and let us know what you want to learn about, what, what you want to talk about next. Um, again, we're doing this for you guys. Um, also, there will be a a survey sent out after this webinar so please complete that at your convenience uh, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up today so Dr. Zaharchuk thank you so much for sharing your research and all of your insights with all of us well thanks so much for the opportunity and I look forward to listening to the the uh, uh, podcast to come yeah <laughs> absolutely okay everyone thank you for joining how deep Image, deep learning and AI are making neuroimaging safer, safer, faster, and smarter. Thank you so much for joining our first webinar, and uh, we hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day.